but I've had the last two weeks of reading and studying and meditating on these verses that I preached on two weeks ago in the book of Romans chapter 7 verses 13 through 25 and review just a little bit on that um one of the things that um, I'm going to be reading a little bit from just a small quote is um out of this particular book it's uh Packer on the Christian Life. There's a whole series of these books and um, published by Crossway Publishers on different people of the Bible, uh, excuse me, not of the Bible, but of church history. Augustine, I have that one. It's what they do is they give a little biographical sketch, and then quoting from their different writings. They explain what they taught and believed the Christ, about the Christian life and how to live the Christian life. Augustine and I have that one. I have Luther and um, Calvin and Warfield. And when I saw this at the store this week, and John, John Newton, I have that one as well. But anyways, when I saw this at the store, yes, I had to get a book at the Christian bookstore. But I'm really, really glad I have this. I think most people are aware of J.I. Packer. He's considered the most influential, along with C.S. Lewis, the most influential theologian, Christian leader of the 20th century. He's still alive. He's 91 years old. And in fact, when I read this, I realized he was born exactly one month after Vicky's mom was born in 1926. And J.I. Packer's most famous book, perhaps, is his book, Knowing God. And if you haven't read that, you need to repent and read it. No, I'm not kidding, but it's an excellent book. But what's, um, one of the reasons I picked it up is not only am I really interested in this, because I really like J.I. Packer a lot, but um, he has a whole chapter in here. Um, he didn't write the book. Uh, uh, other authors write the books on the individual, okay? Sam Storms wrote this. He's a theologian. A whole chapter on Romans chapter 7 and what J.I. Packer believed about Romans chapter 7 verses 14 to 25. And then at the end, Sam Storms gives his own little plug as to other reasons why he personally believes other than Packer's reasons for chapter 7 verses 14 to 25 referencing believers so i was kind of excited to get that because it caused me to dig just a little bit more and to study a different a little bit more and um and then to look at these verses but i want to say something um about these verses which i'm going to read in a moment i had um labored much over these verses i um, preached on it two weeks ago and it's something i have studied over the years and have a, a view that I shared and still hold. And then I saw the arguments of J.I. Packer that it's a, actually a regenerate Christian that Paul is referring to in verses 14 to 25 of Romans chapter 7. Sam Storms gave several reasons, which I'm going to read a couple of those. Because I've just, you know, and Vicki had suggested this to me. She goes, spend one Sunday giving the perspective that you had preached, you know, that it's referring really to the Jewish world in particular, but in also reference to the Gentile, that it's the unregenerate and how futile it is to find righteousness through the law because of the power of sin. And, um, and then to give a week to the other view that it's referring to the struggle that a regenerate Christian has in the Christian life. And so that's what I was preparing for today. But as I was praying through the week, and I did a lot of walking this week. I walked probably about eight times out of the 10 days we were there, 10 or 11 days. And I love walking. There's my favorite place in the whole world to walk and my favorite way in all the world to get exercise because it's all these massive hills and you're walking through beautiful trees. It's just, just a gorgeous area. 
and it really helps you to contemplate and to pray and to think about the Lord. And I kept thanking him and thanking him and thanking him for the beauty that I was seeing. The, the, the leaves are beginning to turn and then the sun and early in the morning when I would often walk or sometimes in the evening, the sun, the angle of the sun and all the leaves and it's just, it's wonderful and it's a wonderful time for communion with the Lord and I was thanking him and thanking him and reminded of um, Romans chapter 1 that the Gentile world that are outside of Christ, they don't thank God for the things he's given so I was thanking him that I was thanking him. You know what I mean? That I could see the glory of God in his creation. And um, I was really grateful for that. And I, was, I thought to myself, if I'm this thankful because of this beauty that God's allowing me to see, it's a gift. It's a gift. He was allowing me to see this. I said, how much more when we get to heaven and we see the glory and the beauty of heaven, are we going to be so thankful? It'll just grab our hearts gratefulness to the Lord for allowing us to see what we're seeing praise the Lord but the the one thing I did as I was praying is I said Lord I really want to understand this I've got that kind of mind that I I want to understand these things I've been perplexed over so many things in Scripture over the years earlier on it was the doctrine of the Trinity as I was confronted with United Pentecostal people the UPC that teaches there is no Trinity, that Jesus is the Father, Jesus is the Son, and Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And the, back before that, when I was a teenager, it was the Jehovah's Witnesses that Jesus Christ is the first of God's creation, Michael the Archangel, he's not really God. So that's one of those many doctrines that I have become so perplexed over, and, uh, and I gotta dig and dig and dig and dig and dig. Well, this was one of them, Romans 7. It just was important to me. I you know, have been saying, Lord, I, I want to really understand this. And so this one day in particular, just last, toward the end of last week, when I was out there walking, and I was asking, Holy Spirit, please, I want to know, um, I want to I understand this, but how is it applicable <laughs> to us? How can we be ministered through this what are you saying in this scripture well as usual God doesn't always tell you exactly what you want to know he's not going to say okay Tom you're right and they're wrong you know that this is exactly what it means but he did just uh, just the next morning I was having some prayer time and God just opened my eyes and my heart to probably the most important thing that's being communicated here and that's what we're going to look at in just a moment. So I wanted to whet your appetite a little bit, but also to say God is faithful. If you, if you just really do the digging, if you stick with him, God is faithful to answer prayer. And that he will use his word not to help you be the most right person about something, but he will open his word to minister to your heart to teach you a, an important lesson of scripture that will just get a hold of you and be a blessing. I'm gonna read these verses starting with verse 13 through 25. Paul says, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So, now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. 
Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. One of the points I had made last week was the use of the first person in this passage that that could have been a rhetorical device used to make more vivid the reality or the truth that Paul is trying to communicate. I really believe that's the fact, that he is using this first person, this testimonial kind of language to make vivid, to make so clear his point and to try to bring understanding to his readers. Last week I um, mentioned some of the reasons I believe this is an unregenerate individual. And there's several different interpretations of this, but just that the fact that Paul had already proclaimed that those in Christ are not in bondage to sin or to the law. Someone who is regenerate would not say, I'm of the flesh, sold as a slave to sin, and that I don't have the ability to ever do that which is right. A regenerate person has the Holy Spirit. They've been set free from the power of sin and not the influence of sin. Sin is still very much there, as we all can testify. Um, but I'm set free from that power, and I'm no longer under the law. I had mentioned that in this chapter, chapter 7, that um, the word law is mentioned 23 times, and grace and the Holy Spirit are not mentioned at all. And it's a person's relationship to the law. Okay? And now we are under a different dispensation, if you will. We're no longer under the law, though we strive out of the gratefulness of our hearts to be obedient to that law. And there are many other reasons which I'm not going to take the time to further expound. You can go online and listen to my message from two weeks ago. <laughs> so anyways, now we're going to look at some of the reasons the other way. And let's keep in mind, in chapter 7, there are three things going on. The first part of chapter 7, which is verses 1 through 6, makes very clear that believers have been released from the law. So therefore the law can no longer defeat or intimidate, condemn or control. In the next section, verses 7 through 13, the law is vindicated. The problem is not with the law, Paul is saying. The law is a good thing. It's spiritual. It's, it's righteous. It's holy. It's good. Now in verses 14 to 25 of chapter 7, the third section, the law can never make truly righteous, save or sanctify. The law cannot make righteous. So, what is a Christian's relationship to the law? Are these verses then about, these verses 14 to 25, about a believer's experience in Christ? Or are these verses for um, referring to an unregenerate individual? Well, like I said, remember the context of chapter 6, 7, and 8. And uh, chapter 6 being no longer in bondage to sin. Chapter 7, no longer under the law. And chapter 8, life in the spirit. Now, 
One of the arguments, and I'm going to look at a couple of the arguments that are used to say this is truly a believer that is struggling with sin. Though redeemed by Christ, though regenerate, and though having the Holy Spirit, we still struggle with sin. I have to be honest with you and say there are some very strong arguments in that direction, and we're going to look at a couple of them. And it really is a fantastic platform for pastoral ministry. Sometimes as Christians, we get so caught up. And if I'm a believer, why do I still struggle? Why do I still fall into sin? Why does sin steam, still seem so powerful? Lord, am I really saved? It can be an assault on our assurance as believers. Our struggle with sin it becomes a great part of scripture in ministering to those kind of questions. So I'm gonna to try to convince you that way now. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna to try to convince you. I'm just gonna lay out some arguments and then I'm gonna bring it down to my main point of what I really believe the Holy Spirit is trying to say to us, no matter which view you may have. One of the arguments that's used, and is, as Sam Storms brings it up in this book, is that these chapters 6, 7, and 8 brought together are really directed toward the believer. Chapter 6 is letting believers know that you're not under sin. Chapter 7 is, is ministering to believers. Chapter 8 is ministering to believers. So a believer has the focus. I want to say one thing about that that he doesn't bring up, and I think this is vitally important and probably nullifies his particular argument. The book of Romans consistently from beginning to end always has the Jewish objections in mind. Paul is consistently talking to Christians and quieting the arguments and the objections of the Jewish leaders or Christians at the time formerly, I mean, who are Jewish believers, but who still rely on the law. Keep in mind this, I'm just going to take a moment to explain this. We live in a very different kind of Christianity than the early church did. The, the earliest believers, including all the apostles, including Paul, saw the coming of the Messiah as the completion of their Judaism. Jesus didn't come to start a whole new movement and say, well, God's done forever with Israel. Now he's starting the church. It's not how the early church saw it at all. The Jewish people who became believers said, he's our Messiah. He, he has finally come, and we, the Jewish people, will now be redeemed and be the head of all nations forever, as the prophets have promised. So, they didn't separate the two as if the church is this, a brand new organization started by Jesus and having nothing to do with Israel. What that did was cause a lot of confusion for many Jewish people at the time. For example, Jesus has come, but he died at the hands of Romans. He did rise from the dead, and I'm speaking as a Jewish believer, believing in Jesus as Messiah. But our whole eschatology, our, our whole concept of the Messiah it hasn't been fulfilled. I don't see Israel as now ahead, the head of all nations. I don't see the king reigning in Jerusalem. The Romans are still in control, and they're threatening us everywhere. So what relationship does this have to us? Another question is, well, what about circumcision? The Messiah has now come. We just don't throw out circumcision. Circumcision was given to Abraham. This isn't the beginning of a new religion. This is the fulfillment of ours. So where, where does circumcision come in all of this? What about the law? What is our relationship to the law? You've got to understand that had to be terribly confusing. 
If you and I lived at that time and we had been Jews, we would have been struggling with all of those questions. And when we get to chapters 9, 10, and 11, we're going to see that there, Paul is dealing with a very strong question that Jewish people had. And it's this one, and it makes a whole lot of sense. It'll make you question too. If he's really the Messiah that's been promised by all the prophets, and he has come, then why has most of Israel rejected him? Why has most of Israel rejected him? Why have so many of our leaders rejected him if he's really our Messiah? You can see how there would be a lot of questions at the time as to this Jesus and what does it mean to me who am a Jew who worships in a synagogue? Eventually, there became great separation between Jew and Christian. Many Jewish people in Palestine in their synagogue worship didn't want the Christians coming around and worshiping with them anymore. They were tired of it. They didn't want to accept Jesus as Messiah. So what they did is they made part of their liturgy a prayer that would in essence curse those who worship Jesus as Messiah. So how could Christians continue to go to the synagogue when as part of the liturgy they had that prayer? There were things that were going on that was bringing about the division, but at the time there were still a lot of questions. So when Paul is ministering to Christians in chapter 6, 7, and 8, it's a mixed group of Gentiles and Jews. He is consistently having in mind the objection and the confusion of the Jew. So yes, chapter 6, 7, and 8 is focused on Christians, but it's also bringing into perspective these objections that Paul wants the Romans to understand that the Jews consistently bring against the church. He is dealing with the Jew and he's dealing with the believer. He's dealing with the the Jewish believer who still is clinging to circumcision and law. I think we need to keep that in mind. Okay, just a couple real quickly arguments in here. Let me find out the exact page. <laughs> Sorry about that, I did not mark it. Ahead of time I know right where it is when I get there. Page 109. A couple of the reasons that are given as to why, um, hold on, I think it might be in Sam Storm's appendix back here. Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> Two different chapters, you know, you gotta. He's saying about the person who says, I, Paul's testimony, who is this person? I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, verse 22. Sam Storms is saying, how can a, an unregenerate person joyfully concur with the law? That's one of the arguments that this is actually a regenerate person. He hates what he's doing in verse, it says that in verse 15. Paul says here, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do what I do not, what I do not want to do. I do the very thing I hate. That doesn't, Sam Storm says, that does not sound like the struggle of somebody who's not saved. Of course, if Paul is being rhetorical, that becomes a moot point. He concurs with the law of God, acknowledging it to be good. <clears throat> According to verse 17, the apostle identifies his ego, the I, his person, with that determinate will, which is in agreement with the law of God. I, I agree with the law of God according to my mind, does an unregenerate person agree with the law of God? I do have to say, as I'm reading each one of these, that at chapter 2 of the same book, Romans, Paul says that the mind of the Gentile who's never heard the law of God has the law written in his heart, and his conscience either accuses him or else it excuses him. So there is a conflict inside of a Gentile who has never received the word of God, who is unregenerate. 
He acknowledges his own innate depravity. He wants to do good. He does not wish to do evil. Um, he feels imprisoned by and in bondage to his sin, and he then confesses his own wretchedness. Wretched man that I am. Would an unregenerate person say, wretched man that I am? Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see that there are arguments there that are very strong, and there's even more, but I don't have the time and the nature of a message like this to get into them. I think there's answers to those questions. And, um, and they would, of course, on the other hand, find answers the other way. J.I. Packer himself firmly believes that this is the ongoing struggle that Christians have in their lives. He's not saying, and there's a different view altogether that says this is the normal Christian life. J.I. Packer and Sam Storms and people like Martin Luther and John Calvin and Sinclair Ferguson don't believe that this is telling us what the normal Christian life is all the time, but it is highlighting the struggle that we continue to have with sin. Interestingly, I have this Catholic study Bible at home, and the note in this Catholic study Bible says, without question, Paul is talking about the unregenerate Jew, but it certainly has full application to a believer. And I think that that note, in my personal opinion, not because they said it, but I agree with that note. I personally believe, and you can believe what you want, study it, and you know, that, that's okay. This is one of those areas where it's fine to disagree. But um, I personally believe it that Paul is in solidarity with Jews, showing that the law can never make righteous. He's ending once and forever, like I said two weeks ago, the dagger at the end of the battle, the final dagger that shows to the Jew forever that yes, the law is wonderful, I absolutely love it, it's holy, it's good, it's pure, it, it's spiritual, it's all inspired by Almighty God, but don't you get it? I'm sold as a slave to sin. So what is our application? <laughs> what is it that for me that the lights went on. Whenever we talk about spiritual experience, there's always a sense of subjectivity to it. But there are times when you know, you, you're reading scripture, you're praying and the lights seem to go on. God illuminates truth to you. I was thinking as I was walking this one evening at down in the mountains that those wonderful times we have with the Lord when, when he illuminates scripture, when we know his presence, it's kind of like a beautiful sunrise. We know it's real, we take it in, but it, you know, half hour later it's dark again. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, we wish it would continue on, but we must be satisfied to live in the dark many times. But when I was praying that following morning and the lights went on, it's almost like the Holy Spirit was saying this. The important thing here is the I. The I. Over and over and over again, Paul says, I, I, I. He says, what I want you to see, whether Jew or Gentile, regenerate or unregenerate, as you have no ability to save yourself, to sanctify yourself, or to obey me, you are powerless you need me it's only in Christ it's only as we rely on the Holy Spirit that we can ever have any kind of triumph I felt that to the core of my being the Lord is saying I want you to know that you are utterly helpless if you think you can go to a church where they have lots of rules like don't dance, don't do this, don't do that, and you can be holier than others, you've missed it. The I is powerless. So if you believe that this is the unregenerate person, you're right, he can never save himself. If you believe it's the regenerate person, well then there's a, an aspect of which you're right. You can never sanctify yourself. God wants us to see that we, can o that we only have the cross. We only have Jesus Christ. 
We are powerless. God's law is holy. God's law is wonderful. God's law is spiritual. It shows the character and the very nature of Almighty God. And yes, we're called to be obedient. Jesus says, he who has my commands and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Yes, that's good. But it's like the Holy Spirit just brought out the word I. I, I, I. The I is powerless. Later in Corinthians, I think of the words of Paul when in the midst of his weakness and being a, having a thorn in the flesh, his oppression by Satan. He said, I cried out three times, God, deliver me from this oppression, this persecution, this harassment by Satan. And Jesus says, my grace, Paul, is sufficient for you for in your weakness you'll find my strength the holy spirit i believe if we take nothing else away from this we'll always remember there's a disagreement as to who it applies to but we don't want to be clouded out we don't want to be so focused on all of the different possible interpretations to the point where we miss the very truth that should pierce our hearts God is telling us you are against sin, against the old Adam, against Satan. You are as a helpless, teeny little baby. Your I, the I, the ego is powerless. You need, you need. It's like God coming as this parent to us. He's our father. And he says, realize that you need me. You can't do it on your own. You cannot overcome any weakness or sin in your life on your own, ever. You need me. The lesson to us is, yes, Lord, I see this picture. I always want to remember this picture because when I struggle, I want to fall at your, at your feet. I want to cling to the cross of Jesus Christ and recognize my own nakedness, my own powerlessness. And I want to realize I need you. I need your salvation, I need your provision, and I need to be empowered by your Holy Spirit. That's why God fills us with his Holy Spirit when we are born again. He gives us a new heart that has new inclinations. And then he gives us his spirit to strengthen us to follow the new in inclinations and to say no to the old ones that still battle against us and will the rest of our lives. That's what one of the things we see in this passage of Scripture. And the neat thing about chapter 8, it's the celebration of triumph. God says, I'm not going to leave you there in chapter 7. I'm not going to leave you there. You'll always be helpless. You'll always be powerless. But I'm going to fill you. I have filled you with my spirit. I'm teaching you a truth that even in the midst of your struggle, get this now, in the midst of what you struggle, in those times when you might even question yourself, am I really saved? How could I have such a lust in my heart and still be saved? How could I have such envy or jealousy and still I'm saved? How come there's such lingering bitterness and yet I'm still, can I, am I really saved? In Christ, Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And then chapter 8 will go on all the way through, finally, at the very end, saying there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you take nothing else out of this chapter, maybe you can even take a Bible and highlight every instance of the use of the word I. Not for the purpose of proving that Pastor Tom's right in his judgment of the passage. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But to remind yourself, the I is powerless. The I really is. The I can't stand up against things like drugs and alcohol and sexual addiction and everything else. The I, the I can't do it. We need that greater power, that one who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who 
went to the cross and in his body suffered our death, was raised again victoriously and brings us into union with himself where he works in me that which is well-pleasing in his sight. I hope that's understandable. I, I hope that's something that will really get a hold of your heart. I know that for me it was really huge to be studying this in my head so much and then to have the Holy Spirit just pierce my heart and say, don't miss the main point here. The eye is powerless. You need Jesus. You need the Holy Spirit. And in times of testing, in times of trial, in the midst of weakness, and no matter how many times you fall, even as you lie in the muck and in the mire of your own perversion and sin, you need to look up to Jesus Christ to save you, to rescue you, to strengthen you, to stand up again and walk with him. It's the eye that's powerless. It's the eye that can't save itself. It's the eye that can't sanctify itself. And it's the eye that can never hang on to the Lord. He hangs on to you. Praise God. Well, I hope that helps. And I am so glad that there's an application in the midst of all of this for me and to share with you. Because sometimes it's, there's technicalities and it's hard to, to see where it really actually penetrates the heart. But I think the Lord has shown us that. So. Praise God. Well, let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you for your word. What a treasure. We thank you that when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, and we see Jesus crucified, naked, shamed, and brutally beaten beyond human recognition, writhing in pain and in agony, being mocked, we see in that image our weakness and powerlessness. And in the resurrection, we see the strength of our Savior. And Father, we place our full trust, throwing ourselves fully on your strength, on your grace, at your feet, in our own weakness and helplessness, we turn to Jesus Christ, our strength. Father, we thank you for this. Be glorified in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you'll stand, we'll sing the doxology together.